Okay, we're going to dive in with some Texas stories first. Okay. Uh, Hurricane Burl came through. There's still recovery going on with that. It was yet another major test of the electrical system at writ large of Texas. How do you feel progress has been made since the freeze, since Hurricane Harvey, on the Texas electrical grid? Well, well, first I will tell you that uh, what, what happened at Hurricane Barrel was, was not a test of the power grid writ large. Uh, it, it was a test of a local power provider, Centerpoint. Mm. Uh, the other power providers performed just well. Centerpoint has had uh, multiple challenges they've dealt with. Uh, they are the large provider in the Houston area, uh, and because uh, they were not prepared for the storm, uh, they had customers who were without power to the tune of more than 2 million customers. Yeah. Uh, and that's why uh, the last couple of days I came down very hard on Centerpoint for not being prepared for the storm. But to answer your broader question, yes. uh, in, in the aftermath of the winter storm a few years ago, uh, Texas has added substantially more power. Texas now produces more power than California and New York combined. And then on top of that, we're adding even more through incentives so that by the year 2030, we, we will be increasing our current power capability by 50 percent. And there will be uh, hardly any country in the world that can provide as much power as the state of Texas will be able to provide. From where you are as governor, with Centerpoint specifically, knowing the Houston region is usually the bullseye for hurricanes, just where it is in the Gulf. Are there any concerns that we are not yet through this hurricane season and more storms may be on the way that could cause damage? Well, there are, and that's exactly why I did what I did a couple of days ago, and that is I issued uh, orders uh, to Centerpoint uh, to provide me a detailed plan about exactly what they will do in advance of the next hurricane. They have to have that to me by July the 31st, and if they fail to do so, I told them I will be issuing executive orders that in Texas have the force of law where I will be imposing my own standards on Centerpoint uh, if they don't uh, create the standards that I think are sufficient. Excellent. That that is a, an answer only a governor can give. Um, I do want to talk about some of the bigger picture things we are at the RNC, after all, and how they impact Texas. Specifically, uh, former President Trump call for a mass deportation. Texas, of course, would be a big part of that. The logistics may fall on the state. How do you feel about the state being prepared for participating in such an operation? Well, for the, for the most part, there, there won't be that much logistics by the state other than one that already pre-exists. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is, if you follow the law, uh, all local governments are supposed to comply with ICE detainer requests. There have been uh, too many sanctuary cities across the country, so much so we wanted to make sure that did not exist in Texas. I signed a law in Texas banning sanctuary cities, mm -hmm. requiring every city, every county in the state of Texas to comply with ICE detainer requests. So in Texas, we already have the infrastructure in place that would collaborate with the federal government to the extent that they want to identify, locate, and arrest people who are here illegally. I believe that what President Trump truly wants to focus on first and foremost uh, is to go after all of the criminal illegal immigrants that are in our country right now. Unfortunately, because of Joe Biden's policies, there will be millions of illegal immigrants in the country who are criminal illegal immigrants. We have to get off the streets. I mentioned just one casualty of, of many mm -hmm. just in Texas alone. 12-year-old Jocelyn from Houston, Texas, was murdered and raped by two illegal immigrants last month. We cannot have that happen again. We've got to get these criminals off the streets. Even from an infrastructure side as far as manpower, if the deportations take place— that Texas border, though, is their next stop potentially. Do you feel that Texas and perhaps Operation Lone Star is prepared, or do you feel there may be a need to even enlist more National Guardsmen and local police into the effort that Texas has at its southern border? So first we've shown that Operation Lone Star works. And what we did, we, we deployed National Guard. Uh, we're building our own border wall. In addition to that, uh, the National Guard have laid down hundreds of miles of razor wire border barrier, uh, and then they guard that. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it's done is uh, during months when we've seen uh, that the illegal immigration population has increased crossing the border of California, Arizona, and New Mexico, it actually has gone down in the state of Texas by 74 percent. you got to show the resistance. If you put up the resistance, illegal immigration will stop. Here's the point. Yep. Uh, what, what President Trump will do uh, he will double down on that effort. He, he won't need our National Guard because he will be actually using the Border Patrol agents to do their job. What Biden has Border Patrol agents doing is doing paper processing, not patrolling and defending the border. 
what, what Trump will do, will, he will uh, reauthorize, once again, the Border Patrol to do their job, and that's to deny illegal entry, uh, as well as to use ICE for what they're intended to do, uh, and that's to apprehend people who come across the border illegally. So then do you believe Texas's par current level of participation will actually decline? So yeah, if, if President Trump lives up to what he says he will do, what he's told me that he will do, and I 100% believe that he will, mm -hmm. uh, it will mean that Texas will no longer need to be playing the role that we play because we will have a president doing the president's job. Let me just add this very quickly. Please. We don't need any new laws. Uh, Congress has in place three laws that Biden could be using. Uh, one is to deny illegal entry. Two is to detain anybody who does enter illegally. Three is to build border barriers. Th those laws already exist. Biden is choosing not to use them. Trump will use them, and when we have a president using those laws, that means that Texas as a state will not need to do what we're doing right now. All right. I do want to talk briefly about the events on Saturday. Uh, obviously, investigations need to be had, uh, people held accountable. But on the political side of things, it's really led to this seemingly national call for unity and decreasing the rhetoric that is taking place on both sides. How do you feel about the results, that secondary tertiary results of Saturday's events. So it could, could lead to healthier conversations uh, in the campaign process. Listen, the, the, the Republicans and Democrats do not, dis, I mean, do not agree on, on anything. They, they disagree. But you, you can... There's a few things that we can yeah. find, but anyway, I you, certainly... You, you, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. And, and, and that is what must be achieved. We, we, as Republicans, can point out the flaws in the Democrats' policy, such as open border policies, mm -hmm. such as uh, spending so much of taxpayer money that it leads to inflation, that you're paying more at the pump, more for your groceries, more for your rent. Uh, we can point that out, just like I just did, uh, w without calling for someone to be murdered. Um, so... I don't know if you actually answered the question, though, then. Do you feel that it will have that impact on both sides moving forward, that that rhetoric will decrease? So so here, here's one thing that we may see, yes. and this is the rumor on the street right now, and, and that is in, in tonight's speech, yeah. uh, President Trump may be uh, showing that sense of trying to unify the country. He has a unique ability right now, having been through what he's been through, uh, to be the, the bigger man, to step up and, and show some unifying threads uh, of how America can uh, stitch itself back together as one country, while at the same time standing for the solid principles that he stands for, America first principles. Elon Musk, he's been making some political waves, talking about his donations recently, but then also some in the business headlines, obviously you're aware, moving two of his major companies' headquarters to Texas. That's the plan anyways. What does that mean for the state to get... Uh, SpaceX and was it Tesla, Addy, that he was moving? I'll give it all to you. So, yeah. here, here, so <laughs> here, here's the full story. My, my relationship with Elon Musk began in April of 2020 when he came to visit with me about uh, setting up a gigafactory in Texas. Yeah. He said he needed to build a gigafactory more than a mile long and get it completed with cars rolling off of it in 18 months. That's unheard of anywhere in the United States. But I told him we could get it done. We did get it done. Ever since then, he saw that he could move uh, at the speed he likes to move at. We have a motto in Texas. We move at the speed of business. And a ever since then, he's been working to locate all of his businesses in Texas. And what he announced this past week is he is moving his headquarters for SpaceX to Texas. The other announcement is that he's moving the headquarters for X or Twitter to the that's state of Texas. Uh, and that's on top of the boring company, on top of Tesla, which has his headquarters there. So the, the headquarters of, of the uh, enterprise for Elon Musk are in the great state of Texas. And what does it mean for Texas to have him and all of those there? Well, so not even counting Musk, Texas has been ranked number one every year that I've been governor for economic development. Uh, Texas has uh, the eighth largest economy in the entire world, uh, and Texas leads the country uh, for new jobs. And so uh, we are a state uh, that's been economically leading this country. But when you add all of the Musk enterprises to it, uh, it just puts us... Uh, you know, on, on booster mode uh, with regard to what's going on. But, but maybe even more importantly, we're always trying to focus on the future. The, the future is in space. The future is in semiconductors. And Texas is leading in both of those categories. How do you deconflict Trump's call to stop subsidizing electric vehicles and even ban some of them with having Elon Musk and Tesla as one of the major companies in Texas? So, you know, I, I can't answer for Elon uh, with regard to the issue, but I believe that Elon uh, strongly believes in, in free markets, and, and, and uh, he, he's ready to, to go all in 
uh, to, to make sure that uh, whether it be producing vehicles or, as he will tell you, mm -hmm. most of what Tesla does is actually not a vehicle company. It's a, it's a robotics company. It's an AI company. It's, it's all kinds of things, and it's quite visionary what he wants to achieve uh, through that. And so most of what he will be doing at Tesla actually will have nothing to do with regard to the federal government subsidies. I have to ask the question. I've had to ask so many people this question, but I have to do it. I think I know your answer. If you are offered a position within a Trump administration, is that something that you would consider? So for one, I, I would be honored. Uh, for another, I want to see the president succeed. He needs the best people working for him. But I'll tell you this. Uh, the, the, the most important political job in America is president of the United States. The second most important political job in America is governor of Texas. And I've already announced I'm running for re-election as governor in 2026 to make sure we keep Texas red and Texas continues to do its part to keep America going in the right direction. Excellent. And last question in your own words, what is the current state of the Republican Party? Uh, unified. Uh, I, I can't remember a convention uh, where we have been this unified. And, and the Republican Party uh, is galvanizing. We're, we're going to turn out in force uh, in this November because uh, we, we see... What is at stake is far more than just the presidency. Uh, we see literally the future of America, and, and we want to, as a party, do our part to steer America back on the right path. It is interesting you say that. I spoke to Sean Steele. He's a sergeant at arms for the RNC. In 2016, he was the same position. He said, bluntly, at that convention, we thought we were going to lose. Hillary Clinton had the money, had the name recognition, and it was a totally different vibe than it is here. Do you agree with his reflection on comparing the two conventions? Well, I, I, I didn't think we were going to lose back in 2016. Okay. Uh, but, but it was different uh, because if you go back to the convention, it was divided on the convention floor itself uh, to the very end. And it required uh, people coming together, which the Republican Party always does, which is why I was not surprised. Mm -hmm. That said, well, when you go back in time, I, I cannot recall a time when I've seen the party is unified. And that was before what happened last Saturday. Yeah. In the aftermath of what, what happened last Saturday, it's more than just the Republican Party that's unified. Uh, it's also uh, Americans uh, as a body. Uh, they're unified. No, no one wants to see anybody assassinated. Uh, and to, to know that this happened in our country, uh, that's, that's a rally cry uh, that we need to come together, rise above our current situation, and as one nation move forward. Anything else that you wanted to add? I think you got it all. Yes. That's always my